Good morning, my name is Jair Chung. Uh, I am from Baylor College of Medicine, a part of the Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy. I wanted to thank Dr. Smeds and Dr. Bath for the kind invitation to present to you how I do it, uh, dorsalis pedis exposure, as a part of the APEX or Advanced Practical Exposures in Vascular Surgery course. I have no relevant disclosures. So first off, why do we care? We care because dorsalis pedis exposure is critical due to the exponential growth of chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Chronic limb-threatening ischemia currently affects approximately 11% of patients with peripheral arterial disease. It has an annual incidence in Western countries of 0.2 to 0.3%, with a prevalence of 1.3%. This results in a two to three-fold increase in the prevalence over the past 20 years. And this is especially true for patients with diabetes mellitus because of the unique anatomy of disease in diabetics. So there's been a near two-fold increase in the prevalence of tibial disease in patients with diabetes. Patients with diabetes are 75% less likely to have aortoiliac occlusive disease. This is particularly true for certain ethnic groups. Uh, for instance, in Hispanics, approximately 30% of them will have isolated tibial disease with relatively sparing of the pedal vasculature. So now that we've gone over um, why this is important, how do we go about selecting the appropriate patients? The first part is we determine who we think is going to be deriving the most benefit from revascularization. And here at Baylor College of Medicine, what we use is the Wi-Fi score in order to determine that. Um, this is taken from a recent paper by one of our residents, uh, Jessica Mayor, um, and this is in uh, the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2019. And what we did is accrue over a thousand patients um, from several institutions that scored patients by Wi-Fi and we imputed the predicted amputation score versus the actual amputation um, when stratified by Wi-Fi. And what we found is that we could categorize patients into four quartiles, those of questionable benefit, those with low benefit, those that are going to re require a moderate benefit, and then the highest benefit um, from undergoing a revascularization. And we tend to reserve our revascularizations, particularly our open bypasses, for those that are going to derive either a moderate or high benefit from the procedure. These are the actual Wi-Fi scores when you break them down that uh, were in the highest moderate low benefit and questionable benefit quartiles. Um, other data that I use to determine who I bypass, um, those that have adequate inflow and outflow. So for this, this requires an arteriogram. Uh, the arteriogram helps me to determine which vessel I'm going to use as my inflow. Um, I like this vessel to be relatively free of calcium, so it's easy to clamp, um, as well as free of any proximal stenoses with triphasic waveforms. In terms of the outflow, I like to ensure that it's not simply just the dorsalis pedis and a very small tretic one without any flow going anywhere else. I like to ensure that there's adequate flow to the tarsals um, and the metatarsal and digital arteries coming off of this and hopefully providing a little bit more flow um, to the lateral plantar as well uh, via collaterals. I like my patients also to be ambulatory with this procedure. It's a rather large procedure. Um, and the ambulatory patients tend to do a bit better. Um, I like patients to have a salvageable foot. And for this, I, I conference with my uh, podiatry colleagues and we discuss whether or not um, the, the wound and the repair of the foot um, would interfere with the exposure that I'm going to need in order to do a dorsalis pedis bypass. And then finally, I like to make sure that they have adequate conduit. I use greater saphenous vein only for this procedure. Um, I like to make sure that it's three millimeters and I use it in a non-reversed fashion to ensure adequate um, size matching, uh, especially at the distal anastomosis. In order to do this in a non-reversed fashion, I use a lamate valve tone that's pictured here. Um, this slices all the bicuspid valves within the greater saphenous vein. So moving on to the dorsalis pedis exposure, this is a schematic of it. 
that I make a vertical incision approximately one centimeter lateral to the extensor hallucis longus. And I mark this in pre-op to make sure that I can see this. I have the patient um, flex their toe against um, resistance, and this exposes the extensor hallucis longus tendon for me. And then I can make my uh, marks just lateral to that. Um, after my incision, I extend it down through the subcutaneous tissues and find the extensor hallucis longus tendon and retract that a bit more laterally. Um, and then I find uh, the chrysalis pedis artery beneath. Um, what we'll find usually is I uh, expose it for a length of about two centimeters, approximately and distally, um, encountering the medial and lateral tarsal branches as well as the arduate uh, artery distally. Um, and I gently loop those with those silk sutures. Other tips for the exposure. Um, in pre-op, it's really helpful to mark the length of the vein uh, prior to your scheduled procedure. Don't trust your ultrasound colleagues. Um, always check yourself. And I use an umbilical tape to ensure that I'm going to have the appropriate length that I want um, from my intended inflow site to the Versalis pedis artery. Um, this helps avoid unnecessary uh, exposures as well as uh, anesthesia. Other tools of the trade. Um, I use a beaver blade for the arteriotomy, the dorsalis pedis artery when the limb is hypoperfused. Uh, it tends to be rather atretic. I like micropot scissors, um, Yazergill clamps if I am going to clamp the dorsalis pedis, um, and then O silk for the tarsal branches, and I gently just loop these uh, singly or doubly. Uh, for the skin, an ALM protractor I found has been the best, um, all the other uh, wheat landers are just too bulky. Uh, the ALM retractors is a perfect size for it, and the teeth within it help to retract the skin and even the, um, the extensor hallucis longus tendon if you need to. If you do have trouble finding the, the dorsalis pedis artery during your dissection, it's helpful to move the extensor hallucis longus tendon. Sometimes the dorsalis pedis artery will lie right beneath it. And then finally, in terms of the anastomosis, I use two 70 prolines. Um, in a running fashion, I anchor them at both the heel as well as the toe of the anastomosis. Um, next, I pick the most distal out inflow, and the reason why is that this helps keep the vein graph shorter and increase the number of patients that you can offer this uh, procedure for. Uh, moreover, the patency of it is unaffected, uh, perhaps even improved, uh, if you use a more distal inflow. You can use a stent proximal to the intended inflow site um, if you have to, though this isn't ideal. What this will do is render your entire bypass patency. Um, it'll make it hinge upon the patency of the stent rather than the other technical factors of your bypass. Um, one other tips of the trade, avoid making railroad tracks. Um, and what I mean by that is a uh, incision um, that's the two parallel incisions, one for the dorsalis pedis exposure and one for a greater saphenous vein harvest exposure. So for instance, um, in this, this picture, the medial is here, the lateral is here. So um, if you're taking a greater saphenous vein from the calf, if in order to get enough length, you have to go down into the foot or into past the ankle, I would advise you to try and avoid that. Um, the reason why is that it'll create two parallel incisions that devascularizes this flap in between and you can get interval necrosis. Um, so other things I wanna highlight about this picture. So this is a recent patient that I did. I want you to note the size mismatch between the vein and the dorsalis pedis artery. Again, the dorsalis pedis artery can become rather atretic. And so this highlights the need to do a non-reversed um, bypass. And, and this will, um, help to ensure the best size match between the vein and your dorsalis pedis artery. The other thing is note where this was tunneled. Um, I tunneled this anterior to the medial malleolus so that I could bring my graft through the apex of the incision and then down onto the dorsalis pedis artery. This avoids any potential um, tracking of the vein graft through here, which is where you can get potentially interval necrosis should you harvest the vein from here. Other tips, uh, post-procedure elevation and compression is key. So what I do is I use an ace wrap and I cut a hole 
in the ACE wrap overlying where the anastomosis is, as well as just a little bit superior to that so that I can palpate the pulse in the graft and ensure that it's still open. And then I can look at the incision um, the entire time. Um, but use the ACE wrap to wrap the entire leg up to the thigh and I elevate the leg while the patient is in bed. Um, this has been particularly important for these bypasses. The skin is very fragile in the foot and that's the only thing that's really keeping the graft protected. And so um, the edema that ensues can sometimes pull this incision apart. And so to, in order to prevent that, you have to wrap the leg and elevate it. Again, um, tunneling the, the vein, this is a, a tricky little thing. Um, what I often do is I try to harvest the, the vein, ideally from the upper leg only, um, to avoid any counter incisions that are made and avoid the rail road tracks that I talked about earlier. Um, you wanna tunnel atop the muscle and underneath the fascia. Again, you wanna tunnel anterior to the medial malleolus. Um, so that the vein graft um, doesn't lie in that area of potential interval necrosis. Um, and it does lie just better that way. Um, and again, avoid, if you did make that skin bridge, avoid tunneling your graft there. That's critical. The outcomes are durable after dorsalis pedis artery bypasses. This is a series done by Pompicelli. Uh, about 17 years ago, uh, 1,000 bypasses in 865 patients. Your limb salvage here was 78% with a one-year patency of approximately 57%. Some predictors of better outcomes was uh, greater saphenous vein usage. Um, and I concur with this, and this is why I use only uh, greater saphenous vein for these bypasses. So with that, I'll close. Uh, again, thank you to Dr. Smeds and Dr. Bath for the opportunity to present.